My name is Nicole Bryan. I run product development at TaskTop. And my name is Jeff Zaborczak. I'm the manager of enterprise applications at Select Medical. Um, my team's over top of all of our service delivery, DevOps, collaboration, and database tools. A little bit about Select. Um, we manage specialty medical services across the United States. So about 150 hospitals and about 4,000 outpatient locations. This would be um, People who come into the hospital need a level of care, um, maybe at the ICU level, for longer than 14 days. Um, so it's a very specialized medical services. Um, we have about just shy of 50,000 colleagues nationwide that we support, and a very small IS team of about 300 people based in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, every day we are privileged to impact the lives of over 75,000 patients through our network of care. So when we started our kind of journey um, looking at flow metrics over the last three years, um, really had kind of six problems that we were trying to solve. Um, first, we were entering data into multiple systems and doing a lot of swivel chairing back and forth. We had work requests coming into our queues and backlogs from a plethora of sources, you know, instant messages, email, um, smoke signals from our customers. Um, we were really missing a lot of opportunities to deliver more because we were context switching so often between all of the different things that were being demanded of our team. 60% of the things that my team delivered were incident resolution. So we weren't really getting to those features in the backlog that were really important to our customers. And all of these factors made it really challenging for us to be able to plan and execute across multiple teams. And finally, we all had to be kind of IT superheroes and, and do heroics all the time uh, to basically be able to deliver what we needed to. So kind of how our transformation journey went. Um, the first thing that we wanted to do is try to get control of that demand. And I think that was a really important kind of step. Um, we had to get intake management in place to reduce all of those requests coming in from multiple sources. We then worked with TaskTop and actually did a value stream mapping for some of our, our key value streams. And by doing that, we were then able to kind of understand you know, how our flow worked, where our handoffs were, where our potential bottlenecks could be. We then looked at our tooling and actually had to simplify and integrate all of our delivery tools together to try to get rid of that swivel chairing that we talked about. And then finally, we've implemented the flow metrics to allow us to monitor and really or orchestrate our delivery. So the first thing that we talked about was our intake process. And what we did to solve this is we developed a custom portal for our business users and product owners. And what this was able to do is allow them to have some skin in the game. Um, basically, they were able to help us to understand things like the return on investment, what their idea was, and kind of who needed to approve it within the business before we started work on it. Um, we reduced our intake down to three ways to do business with IS. They could submit an idea through Zipline, they could submit a service request through our portal, or they could submit an incident through our solution center. And we basically were able to successfully work with our business product owners and, and customers to close all the other doors. We got rid of the emails and instant messages and Excel spreadsheets of demand and really centralize on just those three methods. Um, the phrase that we've used to describe it is, if it isn't on the list, it doesn't exist. And these are the only three ways to get work onto the list. When we started, um, and I'm sure if, if any of you have ever started to do a value stream mapping exercise, um, this is kind of what our flow looked like on kind of day one. So we had a lot of arrows going to multiple different stakeholders using all of their own disparate tools. And the result of this was really kind of chaos, right? There was no source of truth. There was no single place I could go to understand where's that idea at in the pipeline? What am I working on next? What's the priority? Um, so what we really did from here is kind of took that and said, what does our value stream really look like? And how can we model that with the right types of artifacts and all of the different handoff points that needed to occur? So we start kind of at the left-hand side with those three ways to do business with us. And we kind of progress all the way to the, to the far left where we could basically say, this is where we're going to implement. And we were able to successfully kind of track all of those different handoffs, all the different status changes and transition points that occurred in our work, and all of the different teams that needed to be involved to make us able to deliver that value. We then took a look at kind of what our tool chain was to deliver. 
Um, you know, we're a ServiceNow customer for our ITSM. We use Azure DevOps. We, back in the day, we used TFS to manage our user stories, our features, our defects, and our CI CD. Um, we had a lot of artifacts that are still in SharePoint. We use iRise for ideation and kind of mockups, test complete for automated testing. And what we also had was a number of reporting repositories powered by SQL Server um, using things to feed our data warehouse, so to Tableau or to MicroStrategy, to, uh, basically to be able to report on our different artifacts. So through kind of that integration with TaskTop, we were actually able to leverage all of their connectors and using a product called Integration Hub, um, actually build bi-directional synchronization for every one of those state transitions and every one of those artifact types. Um, this basically eliminated that challenge of it being difficult to plan and execute across of our teams because now every one of those different transition points was synchronized. So let's say an incident came in through the help desk, that's actually creating a defect in my backlog in Azure DevOps. When my developer updates the state or puts a work night on it, the help desk is able to see that in near real time. So they were able to focus on the customer service, freeing up my developers to be able to really um, do development and make sure that they built quality code and got it delivered on time. We were also able to leverage an extensive amount of reporting out of all those different systems of record um, using some database connectors that came with the TaskTop product, and that allowed us to modernize that data reporting warehouse as well. And so the, the question everybody always asks is kind of, well, so what? What were your benefits? And really, we, we were able to demonstrate value on this within 24 hours of our initial go live. Um, so the first team that we actually did this integration with was our Epic EMR team. It's about 50 colleagues, um, various business analysts, developers, and folks who are configuring that EMR for our clinicians. Um, within the first 24 hours, we synchronized over 1,200 incidents out of the help desk, and then we're able to work with the team to actually deduplicate their backlog and basically eliminated 671 items that were duplicate or triplicate requests from things that were already being worked as a ticket. So basically we found almost 4,700 hours of work in, in one day that was no longer necessary or was duplicated. We also figured out that that time that the um, IT staff was spending swivel chairing and keeping all those different systems up to date, it was actually 12 hours of effort a day among 50 people, making sure that all the statuses and work notes and all those other pieces matched. So just by in implementing that benefit on 50 team members, we immediately saved a full FTE a day. And then how did that really affect our delivery? So kind of the graph that's up here really shows the breakdown of the type of work artifacts that we were delivering. You know, Blue were our features or our enhancements, red were our defects or incidents, and gray was kind of the technical debt that we were trying to remediate within our, our pipeline. Um, as you see, kind of starting at the far side of the graph, we had a lot of incidents and debt, and we were kind of bottlenecked on our feature delivery. Keep in mind that with the same size team, we added no staff during this period, but really by starting to reduce that, um, we were able to start to really maximize our feature delivery for the Epic team there. Um, this really got us out of the business of, of incident resolution. It really pushed first call resolution to our solution center. We were able to kind of identify those key items that were painful, wrote knowledge articles so that we could kind of offload that support function to our solution center, free our developers and analysts up to actually work more on the feature work that they needed to to deliver. And you know, now our, our incident percentage is only about 6% of the work compared to over 60% before. And I just want to point out quickly, remember this graph. Keep this graph in mind. And keep in mind that it looks very like from Excel, I think. Yep, Something it was like absolutely that. from Excel. <laughs> okay. Cool. So kind of the key takeaways from this first part of the transformation. Um, the first was connect your value stream together. Integrate your tool network. Get rid of those swivel chair moments and, and get your data synchronized. It's going to save you a lot of time and, and really allow you to be most efficient. Second takeaway is use those flow metrics to try to identify your bottlenecks, dependencies, and to find those opportunities in your value stream to deliver more. 
And the third is to really align the products, your applications, and your teams uh, to, to optimize delivery, right? So if by focusing on the outputs, you know, by, by really trying to get those features that were critical for the users up in our backlog and prioritized, they viewed our team as a lot more valuable. And then when we've needed to do things like partner for resources or budget allocation, um, we had a, a much bigger bargaining chip with them rather than we did before. So um, as you can see, Jeff and his team um, have uh, spent a lot of time thinking about their value stream and their end-to-end -end flow. And now what we're going to focus on um, is talking really about how they're using the actual flow metrics. Um, and what's really interesting, uh, Jeff and Slug Medical have been working with us for over three, three years. And um, I'm not even sure either of us realized at the beginning that y'all were embarking on the flow framework. But on the left here, you see, is it on? No, on the right. Um, you see the flow framework. And uh, they immediately um, understood the importance of um, integration and the importance of automated integration, as he describes it, for the swivel chair movements. And so um, they've been using TaskTop Hub um, for years. Um, and now um, they've uh, very kindly um, been willing to work with us as an early customer of TaskTop Viz, which actually completes the Flow Framework um, implementation. So um, uh, we call it kind of TaskTop Viz is value stream visibility. TaskTop Hub is value stream integration. That's a lot of big words. So the easier way to remember it is TaskTop Viz, see it. TaskTop Hub, fix it. Um, and so what we're going to do now is uh, Jeff has, uh, he happens to be a really good storyteller, and he has endless stories to tell around how his team is actually using, using the flow metrics um, to help his organization. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit about, first about the actual usage of the metrics, and then a little bit of behind the scenes uh, around, around the metrics. And we're going to attempt, if the internet is working, to show the product at the same time. So first, um, the metrics. So the first uh, challenge that we really had is that we had a lot of work items that were in flight simultaneously. And our dilemma was, you know, where should we be investing? How do we fix that bottleneck? So looking at a live dashboard here inside of Viz, um, the flow load is actually helping us to highlight that work that's either in progress or blocked. And by identifying those bottlenecks, basically what we were able to do is to, to kind of start to uncover that the bottleneck, we, we initially thought it was a development problem. We didn't have enough developers and not, an, you know, not enough work was being put through. And by peeling back the layers, we were actually able to, to get to the bottom of it quickly that the bottleneck was actually that we didn't have enough business analysts. Our ratio of developers to business analysts was incorrect. So the bottleneck on the developer side is that they were consistently having to context switch. So I'd start to work on this feature. I'd get to a point where requirements were unclear. OK, I got to put that on hold, go over here. And then I start working on this thing. And then I got to a point where that wasn't. And by connecting that all together, um, we actually were able, probably for the first time in select medical history, um, to actually get a resource allocated to us outside of a budgeting cycle, which, as far as I know, has never happened in the history of IS at Select Medical. Um, and we were actually able to get that business analyst hired based on taking this live data to our CIO. Yeah, and so I'm just showing here how they're able to drill into, we call it finding the bottlenecks, um, where um, they see their flow load. I clicked on analyze load, and you're able to go in and um, get a sense of where your outliers are, and very quickly, um, directly from the ground truth of what's actually in the tools that are being used, um, see where your bottlenecks are. Um, and that's, um, a, that's probably one of the biggest benefits we see across all of our customers is that ability to find those bottlenecks um, over time um, and, and consistently. And it's actually become part of our process now during our retrospectives. We are actually looking at those bottlenecks to see if anything has changed or as we make small process or tooling changes to basically try to absorb those um, and make sure that they're actually working right away. So the second challenge, and we talked a little bit about this before and how we resolved it on the Epic team. Um, now we're looking at kind of my team that manages service now. And again, we, we found that most of the work that was being delivered was incidents and defects. Um, customers were reporting a huge spike in, in incidents basically after every go live. 
So using kind of flow distribution, what we were able to see is that we were on, we had using kind of task top hub, we had gotten to the point where we were actually able to do a, a production deployment every week for that product. What we started to learn as we peeled back the layer is that that huge influx of incidents coming in weren't actually technical defects, but what they were, it was kind of problems with the onboarding or education of the users that were, you know, they were reporting that something was incorrect in the system. However, the system was working, all our tests were passing, everything was good. And by kind of investigating that a little bit further, what we were able to find was that we were iterating too quickly for our users to keep up with us. Um, Select's use, user base, as we said, is mostly clinical users. These are users who kind of expect training and communication about all the changes in their applications. So when you change the behavior of the shopping cart button in ServiceNow, uh, they, they kind of lose their marbles a little bit and say, everything's different, this isn't right, I better call the help desk, because that's what they're trained to do with their medical record system. And so what we actually did to kind of solve that problem, we were able to basically work with the business and say, rather than delivering code on a weekly basis, let's actually artificially delay those releases to once a month so that it can coordinate with the training and outreach that the operations team does with their clinical staff. So we got a little section in their newsletter of all the new features and it basically almost eliminated our incident count entirely. Um, if, if you look kind of at the far side of the graph, you can see the red just kind of almost getting eliminated after we implemented those changes and the users realized that these were planned and the, this wasn't something that was happening kind of against their will. And flow distribution, um, I wanted to show this one highlighted where you can see the change of the overall work, but I'll go back to um, go back to Tasktop Viz and show it there as well. Um, flow distribution, I think personally, is the unsung hero of the flow metrics. You'll hear lots of people talking about the flow metrics and you hear lots about flow time and cycle time, but personally, I believe flow distribution as a, as a product manager myself is probably the, the most important, um, the most important uh, metric because it allows you to, uh, without too much emotion, make sure that the business users actually understand all of the types of work that are necessary in order to build a successful product. And so you might think, and Jeff and I were talking about this earlier, you might think, oh, this is great. Jeff's team doesn't have, isn't working on very much um, tech debt. Actually, I would argue, um, I think you've got a problem coming, right? Because at the end of the day, if you aren't, um, if you aren't focusing on all four of the flow item types, you eventually are gonna have a, a, a train wreck. Yep. And so flow distribution is, is the easiest and best conversation starter with your business users to help them understand the different types of work that are important to complete. Yeah, and in, and in fact, what that's actually prompted kind of with my, my team of product owners is the idea of introducing a, like a quarterly maintenance release to address some of that tech debt and, and kind of risk items that we could get rid of. And by doing so, basically allowing us again to kind of keep up with the product upgrades and things that we need to do to keep it stable. So yeah, I usually in every talk I give, I say if you only remember one thing, um, minus all of his stories, flow distribution I think is, is very important. So next up. Yep. So the next challenge is so now that we had these metrics, you know, how could we be a little bit more holistic in our management? You know, one of the one of the challenges is we always want to maximize our delivery, but I also don't want to be leading a death march of development where my staff is turning over and they're not happy or satisfied with the engineering work that they do. So one of the challenges that we really had here, and it's it's similar to the story we were just talking about, by we were our dilemma was that we were delivering feature after feature after feature, but the devs were kind of getting frustrated because some of those items weren't actually getting addressed. So they had these little like nagging pains in the side of of things that made their job harder that weren't ever getting prioritized. So what we were able to do holistically, starting to look at multiple flow metrics, um, that, that's where the conversation started around introducing some of those maintenance items on a more regular cadence. 
So, you know, working kind of with, with ServiceNow, you know, we, we actually moved on to a more regular release update train for the product uh, to take some of those fixes and enhancements that made the developer's life easier. Um, we were also kind of measuring kind of our customer satisfaction. You know, we knew, use a number of surveys and tools there. And what we found is by having that more strategic approach, um, they were much more satisfied with their jobs, right? The, the quality of their work went up because they knew that those pain points that they were logging as defects and kind of long-term backlog items, you know, architectural stories, that they were actually going to get addressed eventually. So then we actually kind of gamified it a little bit. We were able to, to take those items and kind of give them like kind of a vote. What are your most biggest pain points? And then we, we got a block of hours from the product owners to actually allocate and, and address some of those issues. So there's a lot of motivation from them to squeeze in as many of those enhancements as they could uh, to try to improve their, their quality of life as, a, as an engineer. And I think, um, as he said, what's... What's, what's really key is to look holistically at all of your flow metrics because there is interplay between them um, and they do affect each other. So just looking here, you can see that the flow load has actually grown quite a bit, um, but the velocity seems to be, um, with a few minus a few spikes, seems to be generally okay. So maybe that means that the load for that team, this is the appropriate load. But this is how you can actually really begin to manage your team holistically by, um, by looking at all of the metrics. So now we're going to talk a little bit about behind the metrics. So hopefully these um, few stories, and feel free to um, come up to our booth afterwards. Jeff is going to be there. He has endless stories of how he's using the metrics. But I wanted to spend a little bit of time on kind of behind the metrics and what's important. Um, what you saw there is the metrics, great. But how many of y'all in this room find it super easy to get all the data you need and produce the metrics? Anyone? Easy? <laughs> Probably not. So uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the behind the metrics. So again, the, the challenge that we had here was how could we adopt the flow metrics and have a minimum amount of process disruption? Um, we wanted to make sure that our changes were data-driven and we had quantifiable results. And we wanted to do so basically valuing that integration that we had already done and understanding all those handoffs that we talked about earlier um, and really to understand kind of what we had to do from a modeling standpoint. So just kind of bringing it up there for just a second, that was our value stream very quickly. You know, all the different products that we have, um, iRise, um, Azure DevOps, ServiceNow, and also our data repositories. So what we were able to do is to take that investment that we made in mapping our value stream, and we could basically translate that visually right into how we mapped our value stream into Viz. So we were able to break down all of the different artifact types and all of those different tools. And also, I don't know if you've used Azure DevOps, but it's a relatively complex network of iteration paths and area paths and all kinds of other dimensions. So we were actually able to take all of that structure and actually map all of those different queues and backlogs and touch points for my team um, right into Viz. That allowed us to, to take our as-is process and derive those metrics from it. Um, we actually rolled it out initially and didn't have to have a conversation with my team until we actually had some data that we could review with them. And it's because it was transparent to them. They didn't have to do anything different in ServiceNow or Azure DevOps to have these metrics collected. And I think the, the thing about process improvement and improving your flow is that you obviously, you do want to eventually change processes that are broken, but what you don't want is to be forced into process change before you know where the problems even are. And so we've spent a lot of time making sure we have very sophisticated uh, modeling capabilities um, because any organization of any size, um, Jeff is super special, but... Um, but most organizations have very complex workflows where you need the ability to have a lot of um, knobs and dials to be able to make sure that you're actually measuring the right thing. And we call that, uh, we call that uh, modeling, whereby you can um, identify what the items are that are debt items, defect items, features, and then um, even going further down than that, uh, identifying then the actual flow states as to whether or not they're uh, they should be considered active, done, or waiting states. 
It was very important to us to do this in a way um, whereby there's no coding and there's no building of data lakes and data warehouses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you simply um, point it at, your, at the tools where your data exists, um, and it begins to capture it automatically, and then you do the modeling on top. And as Jeff knows, you're going to model, and then you're going to remodel, and then you're going to remodel, and that's OK. Yep. And iterating on it is actually, is actually, a, good, um, is actually a good thing. And, and what it's done as well, because we brought our product owners into that modeling process, they have a little bit of ownership of these metrics now as well. So even though these are non-technical users, um, they actually were really excited. We showed them that landscape picture and actually explained to them all the different teams and people that were involved in delivering their changes. And that was a really empowering moment for both them and my team, because suddenly it wasn't always, why, Jeff, why is your team not delivering? It's, Jeff, why is the organization as a whole not delivering. So it allowed them to actually have some conversations with other groups as well. And it, it's really helped us to transform that conversation with the business. And it is all about the conversations. And I would say the most common conversation across all of our customers that have been using this is it's really pretty amazing. It's very impressive that people tend to plug it in, they turn it on, they've mapped all their states, and lo and behold, um, it's amazing. Their flow efficiency oftentimes is Look at that, 87%, 90%. The industry average, I think, is more like t actually 20 or something. And, um, and what the reality is, is that people aren't mapping, they aren't mapping their weight states. And so it, this allows you to say, oh, really, that is super great. The year 90% efficiency. So you should be pumping out stuff you know, every day, all day. And yet somehow you're not. Um, and so what's really great to be able to do is to go in and show people where they're, that you're actually having quite a bit of weight state work that you're not even tracking. Um, and so I think that is extremely important. That's the most common thing that we see is that weight states aren't being tracked. And so what, then what you can do, as we said, model, remodel, remodel, um, you can go in and make some changes to your tools, maybe add a status, add a tag, then come back in and do the remodeling and regenerate all of your flow metrics. Yep. What we found actually with ours was that Azure DevOps doesn't have an on hold status for its features or its user stories. So we're actually implementing that um, actually next week. Um, so just like an incident or a defect, they can mark that item on hold and actually put it into an inactive or a wait state while it's blocked. Also gives us a reason uh, at that more granular level to be able to report on that attribute. So hopefully will help us get a little bit more visibility into, into that piece. So the last one? Yep. So the last one is that really with, with our flow, as, as we talked about, you know, we have a relatively simple tool chain for our, our set, but it does cross many tools and boundaries. You know, we really kind of needed that single view, but what I didn't want to have to do is build some type of a, a data mart, a data lake, a data repository. You know, I really just wanted to be able to pull that, that information out, and I wanted to be able to do so kind of in, in real time. And so, um, TaskTop Hub is built on um, the 60 connectors that TaskTop has invested in quite heavily. And those 60 connectors then are also what powers Viz. And so uh, we can um, connect to any of these 60 um, end tools across all aspects of, of your actual end-to-end -end flow, meaning ideate, create, release, and operate. So this is way larger than code commit to code release. This is all the way from ideate through to operate. Um, and yet um, it then uh, captures everything and consolidates it into a single pane of glass um, for your flow metrics. <coughs> so I think we are almost out of time, but I wanted to just go through the top things that we've learned from our customers um, that are, have been kind enough to do um, early access usage with us. Um, and the first one is kind of a weird se sentence, but it's don't start at the end, start before the beginning. So do not wait until you think you have the perfect process or the perfect workflow. Or if you're embarking on the project to product journey, don't wait until you've done all of the product modeling um, that can take a very long time. Fundamentally, you all have a workflow. Um, so go ahead and start um, understanding what that workflow is. And then you're making intentional and conscious uh, changes to, to those workflows. Um, and in order to do that, the second point, um, sophisticated modeling is more, than, is more important than you think, and Jeff has actually been extremely kind. Um, I can tell you that our developers did not realize how sophisticated the modeling needed to be, um, and Jeff helped us um, realize that. Um, and so that is a very important part of the journey. 
as I already spoke about, most customers don't actually track all of their wait states. Um, so that's a great thing to, to go back and start thinking about. Um, and also, most customers actually are not tracking all four flow item types. I'd, I'd love to get a show of hands. How many of y'all are actually tracking features, defect, risk, and debt separately? Right, so, um, okay, it's getting a little bit better, but that's another thing that is super important to be able to understand your flow is to be making sure that you're actually tracking all four of those types. Um, and last, metrics are purely conversation starters. And speaking of conversations, we're out of time, but we would love to continue having conversations with y'all. We'll both be at the Task Top booth today and tomorrow and um, look forward to hearing y'all's stories about how flow metrics can help y'all. Thank you.